Our last speaker for the day is Holden Carroll. Holden is an active open source contributor, uh, particularly to Spark, and has co-authored numerous books on the subject. Um, she's based in San Francisco, working as a software development engineer at IBM Spark Technology Center. And today, we're going to hear about improving PySpark performance. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you all for staying. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thanks for staying for the last slot. I, I know it's, it's a long day, and I'm probably gonna pass out right after this talk, so, so thank you for hanging in with us. Um, so yeah, I'm Holden. Uh, my preferred pronouns are she or her, and I, I do work at IBM Spark Technology Center. I'm a Spark committer, um, which is nice, uh, except now it means I can't just blame other people for my problems in life. Um, now I'm partially responsible for my own problems in life. Uh, but if you come to me with Spark problems, I will still blame other people. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if you're interested in uh, feeling really good about not living in America. Um, and uh, I've got a slide share where, where the slides from today's talk will go. Uh, and I've got a LinkedIn and GitHub as well. Um, the GitHub, I know what to do with the LinkedIn. I really hope someone figures out what that's for, um, but my boss seems to like it. Um, and if this is your first Spark-related talk, I'm sorry, this is not a great intro to Spark, um, but I do have some other videos that you can check out, and they're, they're on YouTube, and hopefully they're fun, too. Um, and so just outside of software, um, like I'm trans, I'm queer, I'm Canadian. That's maybe less surprising here than in America. Um, and I consider myself a part of the broader leather community. Uh, and this is just like a reminder, like there's a lot of different types of people in the world. Um, we all write software, well not all of us write software, but many of us write software, um, and we should be nice to everyone. Um, you know, uh, this slide matters more in America, personally, but, but I hope you all are, are nice people, and, and please continue to be nice folks, and if you're not, just fake it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. Uh, this is the mandatory slide from my employer. Um, we have this office, uh, with, we've got this lobby, it's got a lot of green in it, which is the color of a passing Travis build, um, and therefore clearly indicates that we write high quality software. Otherwise, these plants would all be red or, or sort of yellow. Um, so if you're ever considering buying a support contract from IBM or whatever it is we sell, um, please buy an IBM support contract. Uh, I don't get involved with selling them, but I'm told if we don't sell anything, I probably don't have a job anymore. So, so buy things from IBM. Um, yeah, uh, there's a bunch of other people who I work with who work on Spark as well. Uh, so it's not just myself. I just happen to like drink a lot more coffee than they do and like talking to humans. So, so I tend to be around more. Um, and we do a lot of work specifically in the Python area. Um, the, the marketing people like this slide because it implies we do more work than we actually do. Um, but you can see here we have a big number and our logo, and then we have some smaller numbers and some names of other companies. Um, so definitely IBM is good, sure. Okay, um, so back to happy, like, computery things. So what, what are we gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about my assumptions about who you all are. Um, we're gonna talk about how to reuse data inside of Spark because this is like a thing which we really should talk about more commonly. We're gonna talk about the challenges of working with key value data in Spark. Um, I'm gonna include the word count example again because everyone really loves word count, which is why it's in every big data talk ever. It's definitely a real world example. Um, we're gonna talk about sort of the, the Python specific challenges of working in Spark, and we're gonna talk about um, this is the part which is kind of sad, is, is how to call JVM code from Python. Because um, sometimes we still need to do it. And then I'll also promise you a magical shiny future where everything works. Um, and the magical shiny future may or may not come, but it comes with like fake engine noises, vroom vroom. Okay, well that's supposed to be funny. So I'm hoping you're nice. Um, if you really don't like pictures of cats, this is not the talk for you. Um, how many people know some Apache Spark? Huzzah, okay. How many people have no idea what Apache Spark is? Huzzah. Okay, lovely. Um, so if you don't know some Apache Spark, hopefully this doesn't scare you away. We'll do, we'll do a very quick tour of it. Um, 
Hopefully you know some good places to get coffee. I've been to like six or seven so far in two days, um, but I still want to go to more places as well. Um, so yeah, let's talk about what Spark is since it appears that a lot of people don't know what it is. Um, so it's a general purpose distributed system. Uh, this means that it's not just like it's not just like a SQL system or not just like an ETL system. We can do pretty much arbitrary code inside of it and it's pretty awesome and happy. Um, Spark does ask us to do this like essentially functional programming type approach to data manipulation. So rather than doing things with like message passing, it really wants us to write things as map statements or flat maps and reduces. Um, and essentially in exchange for restricting ourselves to this sort of paradigm, um, it promises to scale our stuff and make it super fast and fun. Um, it's an Apache project, so it's not an IBM project, despite the earlier slides and what the IBM salespeople may imply. Um, and it's faster than Hadoop MapReduce. Um, and I really love Hadoop MapReduce. It set this nice low bar for us to just like hop over. Um, and it's really good for when problems become too big for a single machine, which is, which is probably why you care about it. Um, and it's got two core abstractions, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on the differences between them. But that's, that's OK. Um, so the, the, the terms that I'm going to use in this talk are RDD, which is a resilient distributed data set. Um, we can think of it as an immutable, magically distributed Python collection. And it totally works. Um, you can put anything you want inside of it, except occasionally things will go boom if you try and put something larger than two gigs in a single record inside of it. But provided that your individual records are like reasonably sized, you can put whatever you want inside of them. Um, Spark also has things called data frames. This tends to make people that work in Python excited because they think about pandas and data frames, and they think about a pandas data frame that's distributed, and that's, that's really awesome. Um, it's not that, but it, it sounds like that could be it, um, but that's not what we get. Um, there's also these data set things that are compile time typed. We don't really care about them because we're working in Python, but that's, that's okay. So why, why do people come to Spark? Um, so for people that are stuck in the Java land, they often come to Spark because they've got a MapReduce job. It's taking about 16 hours to complete. They search on Google, how do I make my MapReduce job faster? And they get a search result which says Spark is 100 times faster than MapReduce. And they're like, well, they probably lied, right? Like we all know vendors lie about benchmarks. But they wouldn't lie by two orders of magnitude. I'll get at least one order of magnitude improvement, and one hour is okay with me. And so then we trick them and they come into Spark and, and then they're stuck coming to these talks. Um, the other one is uh, their data just doesn't fit in memory anymore. So when, you're, when your data frame isn't fitting in memory, you come to Spark because you're like, I really, I want my stuff to work and it's just crashing. Sometimes people come to Spark because their data doesn't fit in Excel anymore. Um, and I love those people. Uh, but yeah, it's slightly, slightly uh, larger class problems that it tends to work better on. And the other reason why people come is magic um, and cat pictures. Um, yeah. more, more realistically, the, the other reason why people come to Spark is that um, unlike a lot of traditional sort of distributed systems, um, Spark ships with a large sort of variety of tools. So in addition to having this like sort of core raw level where we can write Python Lambda expressions over our data and do really sort of arbitrary things, um, we've got a SQL engine so we can write SQL expressions on top of our data. Uh, if you want to do streaming data, we've got some streaming stuff and we have a bunch of machine learning tools and these all ship together. And sort of in the traditional Hadoop ecosystem, what happens is you have six different packages uh, released on different schedules that use incompatible versions of protobufs in between them. And then your system administrator cries. Uh, and then you can just come to the wonderful world of Spark. Yay. OK. So there is a catch. Um, and that is that Spark is written in Scala. Scala is notably not Python, um, as much as we may wish that it was. Um, and it also has the slight problem of that it runs on the JVM. Uh, and so we have to get the JVM and Python to be friends. And we want to still be able to use libraries that are useful, so we're not going to do it in Jython. Um, right? We want to be able to use Pandas. We want to be able to use Scikit-Learn. We want to have fun with our lives. Um, so PySpark looks at this problem and says, 
I know the solution to this problem. It's serializing everything as strings. And technically, that is a solution. Um, and it, it turns out that if you have a lot of money, you can just buy a lot of machines, and, and that works out. And, and this is essentially proof that you can do really inefficient things when you have money. Um, but we're going to talk about how to avoid some of these problems, just in case we don't have an infinite number of machines. Um, and Spark SQL is, sort of solves this problem and doesn't just serialize everything as strings back and forth across the wire. But, but you can actually get really far with that. Um, so this is, this is what the PySpark architecture looks like. Um, this architecture diagram illustrates that I have yet to convince the designers to work with me on any of my slides. Um, but we can see here we have a driver process where we've got Python talking to Java. And we feel a little sad about that, but it does the job. Um, and so we'll ask Spark to do something in Python. And it'll then go ahead, ask Java, like, this is the thing I want you to do. It'll take my Lambda expression. It'll send it over the wire. And then we'll have all of these different worker machines to do our actual computation. And they'll take the Lambda expression, deserialize it, get our data, and, and do the actual work. Huzzah. Right, so this impacts PySpark in a few different ways. Um, the Python worker startup, like we all know, Python VMs take a bit of time to start. But at the end of the day, we can amortize that cost, um, also known as pretend it doesn't exist uh, when I have enough records. Um, really, the part which I find hurts me the most is that the error messages don't really make any sense at all. Uh, you get a Python exception wrapped inside of a Java exception wrapped inside of another Java exception, wrapped inside of a Python exception when something goes wrong. Um, so if you're using Spark and you're like, I don't know what the hell just happened, that's normal. Um, do not feel bad. Uh, the, the double serialization cost is the thing we're going to focus on today, though, because we're going to talk about how to make it go fast. So hopefully I didn't scare away the people that don't know Spark yet. If I did, please do not tell my boss. Um, and yeah. OK, cool. Yay, we're going to get everyone's favorite word count example. Um, now, as we can tell, this cat is about to get covered in water and scratch our eyeballs out. So there is some mistakes with our word count example here. But this will technically produce the right answer. It'll just do it inefficiently, right? Um, so here we can see we've got this thing called the Spark context. We can use it to load data. Uh, in this case, we're loading text files. Um, these text files could be terabytes of text files stored in HDFS or NFS or whatever thing we've got. Um, we can tokenize our data with the very fancy space tokenizer. Um, living in America, I get to mostly pretend that other languages don't exist. Uh, here, I think you might not have that luxury. Uh, but so you put your fancy tokenization logic inside of that. Uh, then we go ahead and we make our word and count pairs. We group them together for all of the same words, and we compute the sum. And this looks pretty reasonable, and so we save the result out. And then I go ahead and I'm like, well, I'm actually, it turns out that the data I'm processing is log files. And I'm really interested in knowing the number of times I've got a warning. So I'm also going to compute that data, too, on my same inputs, right? Um, but so what is, what is wrong with this? What, what is going to make Spark not be super efficient in this case, right? We've, we've complied to its contract, right? We haven't tried to mutate the RDDs. We've done, essentially, functional transformations. But things are still going to be sad, and we're still going to lose our eyeballs, because this cat is going to be pissed off. Um, so the problem is that Spark is really cool, but it's not a compiler. Um, it cannot see into the future. Oh, uh, I had a Marty McFly image that I wanted to put here. Um, but we, we can't see into the future. And so what this means is that when we, when we go back here, Spark can, can see here, right? We, we ask it to save this result out. And Spark's optimizer can see all of the things we've asked it to do so far, but it doesn't know that we're going to immediately try and do something else with the same data. So when we were going to use data multiple times, we have to help Spark out um, by explicitly caching the stuff. Um, it's pretty easy. We just, we just persist, and we tell Spark, hey, I want to use this data twice. And Spark is like, oh, awesome. Thanks. Um, OK, the other problem is we might have key skew with our data. Um, and if we were doing this with like log files, we probably, I mean, if your code is anything like mine, you would have a key skew for the word error or the word warning. Um, if you're lucky, you might have key skew for the word pass, 
Like that, that would be really exciting. Um, but if you had humans, you might have key skew for zip codes or postal codes. Um, because it turns out humans, we, we cluster in cities and, and we do these inconvenient things. Um, if you have like data about computers, uh, it's probably clustered around something called null. Uh, I don't know why, but null is very popular this season. Um, it is definitely the new black. Uh, and so the problem is that key skew can make Spark behave in, in not so great ways, right? Um, and at the end of the day, this is because the magic, magic isn't perfect. Uh, and so essentially, Spark tries to split up our data amongst these different workers that we were showing earlier. But part of how this happens is it tries to do this by key. So if we remember when we were creating these word count pairs, it was going to be using that word information to try and split up the data onto different machines so that it can do this processing efficiently. Um, so group by key is part of our problem here. Um, it is pretty evil. Um, and the, the part which makes me really sad about group by key is that it sounds really safe, especially if you come from a database background or something like that, right? Like you group your data together by key, and then you compute some aggregate statistic over it, and that's normal, right? Or at least I think that's normal. But in Spark, it's actually evil, as evil as this cat. Um, and so what happens is that once again, Spark can't see in a place where we might expect it to be able to see and optimize this, this problem away for us. Um, so when we call that group by key on that RDD, Spark creates this giant list of all of the records, right? Or sorry, for each key, it creates a giant list of all of the values. Um, and then it applies the sum function afterwards, right? And the problem is it doesn't see inside of the lambda expressions that we give it. It can optimize sort of on the flow of the different transformations, but it can't see inside of our lambdas to optimize them. So we have to help it out a little bit more. Um, oh yeah, here's, here's what it looks like. Um, this is if we pretend we're in San Francisco, I've decided I want to get out of technology and I want to start an artisanal mustache wax shop. Um, and so 94110 is the mission district in San Francisco. There are a lot of hipsters. It would be a good place to open a mustache wax shop. In fact, there are so many hipsters that the number of records of these hipsters will crash my computer when I try and make my marketing merge. And then I'll be very sad. Um, but that's, that's okay, with the hipsters and their mustache wax. There's actually surprisingly few mustaches for how much good your coffee is. I'm very impressed. Um, right, so, so what we actually do in Spark, instead of doing group by key, is we use this other primitive that Spark provides us called reduce by key. And the difference is, essentially, instead of telling Spark, make this giant list and then compute the summation, we tell Spark, as you find things which have the same key, this is the rule that you can apply to compute the summation or whatever aggregate statistic I'm interested in as we're going. Um, and so we can use reduce by key and then our word count is safe. And you know we've got this nice five line example that we can claim is better than 100 lines of Java code, um, which once again, low bar, but you know, it's nice. And um, we have this really safe reduce by key example. Um, Here's an example that you can't read, but I assure you uh, this is on kilobytes of data because I wanted this to actually succeed. But we've got some input data, and my shuffled write is larger than my input. And when we do this with reduce by key, what happens is we have some input, and then our shuffled write is actually smaller because what happens is as Spark is processing the data locally on each machine, it, it sort of applies this reduction before it even has to send the data across the network. Um, so each machine is responsible for a piece of the input data, and then for each of the words, we, we reduce that countdown in advance, and then we, we shuffle it around afterwards. Do, do, do. Right. So whenever you find yourself using group by key inside of Spark, just use reduce by key or aggregate by key. Your life will be a lot simpler, and your jobs will succeed more frequently. But so even, even though, like, even if we do all of those things, right, like our, our Spark jobs will start to work, right? Like we've, we've got Spark and it's going to be in a good place. Um, but we're still not going to be as fast as the Scala code that some other people are going to be writing on Spark, right? Like we're going to succeed on large data sets, but we're not going to be like amazing. Um, like it would be a meets expectations instead of exceeds expectations. Um, so the, the challenge is, 
even when we do our reduce by key, we have to copy data from the JVM to Python and back really frequently. Um, instead, we can use Spark's data frames, which while not pandas data frames, do really awesome things for us in that they take all of the operations that we ask Spark to do that it can understand really well and it just compiles them down to sort of JVM execution plans. And this is really convenient because it means our data gets to live inside of the JVM without having their copied to Python. And now this, is, this might sound sad to you, this might be like making you cry on the inside, but it, it makes your job run a lot faster, so even though like, our data isn't living inside of Python, it's, it's possibly worth it. Yeah, right, so, so essentially what happens is um, instead of having a Lambda expression where we put whatever we want, we have to write things inside of this, this little DSL. And when we write it in that DSL, the operation can happen purely inside of the JVM. Now, now the nice thing about this is that we can do these parts first, and then we can start using our Lambda expressions when we want to get down into actually doing some really awesome scikit-learn stuff, right? So essentially, if you've got a large data set, right, like you've got terabytes of data, but then you have some filtering conditions or some other really simple things that Spark can understand nicely for you, you can have those pieces just evaluated purely inside of the JVM first, and then once you've got it down to a more reasonable size, you can start doing your operations in Python, and you'll pay the serialization cost, but it'll be, it'll be comparatively fast. Um, there's a bunch of reasons for why they're good for performance. Since most people here are new to Spark, we'll just, just trust me on this, and if you don't, you can go read this slide later, but it's, it's definitely fast. And I have this benchmark, which, um, Bigger numbers are bad, unlike the previous slide where IBM had the big numbers. Uh, those, those big numbers were good. Uh, these big numbers are bad. These are execution time. Uh, unless you're running on IBM soft layer, uh, in which case, please use group by key. Uh, I think we charge you by the hour. Um, right, so we can see here, you know, reduce by key in Python uh, performs better than group by key, right? Like we actually succeed. Uh, but if we do the same operation on data frames, it runs a lot faster, right? Because what's happening is these are actually being evaluated inside of the JVM, and, and we don't have to copy our data to Python. Um, yeah, here's word count yet again. I'm, I'm sorry. If, if I don't put word count in every one of my examples, they, they take away my big data license, and as a licensed big data professional, um, I live in San Francisco. Without doing big data, I really just can't afford the coffee. Uh, it's, it's a rough life. It's a rough life. Thank you for laughing at my really corny jokes in the last slot. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so, okay, there's, there's another option, um, but we're running a bit low on time. Does anyone really like writing Java code? Two people. Okay, cool. Um, so, find those two people, and you can get them to write the, the part of your Python code which is taking way too long, and then you can, you can call it from Python inside of Spark, and, and for those two people, we'll talk later about how to make this happen. But we're gonna, we're gonna skip forward. Um, essentially, the TLDR is you can peel back the covers and do a lot of terrible things with Spark and Java if you really, really want to, but I don't think this is the audience that wants to do that. Um, so instead, we're gonna talk about the future. And the future is awesome, um, in part because it doesn't have to exist today, so it's a lot easier to tell you that things are gonna work well and believe it instead of things that happen today which I know are bad. Um, so the future for Spark and Python is, is actually really exciting. Um, we recently integrated Apache Arrow. Has anyone heard about Apache Arrow? Come on, hands, two people? There's gotta be more people than that. Okay, Apache Arrow is really awesome. It's Wes McKinney and a lot of really cool people. Um, it turns out finance has a lot of money uh, and they make kind of cool software sometimes. Um, but so we're starting to use Apache Arrow inside of Spark to accelerate the interconnect between Java and Python so that this serialization cost uh, will go down and that whenever we need to write our arbitrary Lambda expressions, they can go really fast even when we're working in Python. Um, and so it's gonna get better, I promise. Uh, you still have to use reduce by key, you can't use group by key, that's still always gonna suck. Uh, 
but it's, it's going to get better. Um, if anyone is willing to share their UDFs in Python with me for benchmarking purposes, I would really appreciate it. Uh, people really just don't believe me when I keep giving them word count benchmarks and telling them that it's definitely worth it and we should integrate these changes that I thought up with over the weekend. Um, it helps when I can get real world use cases. So I would really, if anyone has, ooh, sorry, real world Spark use cases you're willing to share with me, it can be from a Hotmail account. I won't ask a lot of questions. Um, just please don't send me something from the NSA from a Hotmail account. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison. Um, but yeah, so yeah, send me your UDFs for benchmarking unless you work for a three-letter agency or whatever the Australian version of a three-letter agency is. Maybe a four-letter, eh, whatever. Uh, OK, there's some Spark resources. Uh, ooh, actually, this is the most important part. This is the part where I tell you to buy books. Um, as mentioned, I'm a co-author of many Spark books, and I have a new one out where I negotiated the royalties because I realized you could do that after I did that three times. I'm not very smart. Um, if you think Spark is really cool, uh, I have this book. It's called High Performance Spark. Um, you can buy it. I get money. Uh, if you're completely new to Spark, Denny has this really awesome book, um, and Tomas as well. I don't get any money from this book, but it's really good. It's called Learning Pi Spark. Uh, if you buy that one, though, please buy my other book too so I can get some money. Coffee is expensive in San Francisco. Um, if anyone really wants to chat about Spark, you can just DM me on Twitter. I don't think there's going to be a lot of people, but we can find some time to chat. Otherwise, I'm just going to go buy some cute stuffed animals for my wife after this talk is finished. Um, but yeah, so does anyone have questions? Or like, can I just go sleep in the bathtub? It's been a long day. Thanks for a great talk. Here's your Python mug. Yay! And, uh, does anybody have questions? OK, I have a question, oh, crap. which is about Arrow. Because this is, because I don't know, I'm surprised that very few people raise their hands about Arrow because, I mean, maybe people who use pandas know it better as Feather. And that is kind of like, the holy grail for people in bioinformatics and computational yes. biology because we have to interact with our users mm -hmm. and our code and getting stuff back and forth. So is that going to make this stuff really easy? Like, can totally. we, will we be able to just like dump stuff in Feather and work with it as if it were Feather and then do this stuff with it? Yeah. So the, the, the goal of this integration is that it's going to break down the barrier between Java, Python, and R. And we can all just live together in this happy space where we pretend the JVM doesn't exist um, and write really awesome distributed systems code. And we can just like switch between these things. Um, and if you, if you really like the JVM, say this is being recorded, I, I, I like the JVM too. It's fine. You can pretend R doesn't exist. I don't really care. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, the goal is that all of these things are going to actually start fitting together nicely. And, and the integration is finally, like, it's not finished, but it's, like, I mean, right now, um, if you have any stuff with date times inside of it, it's, it's terrible. But, like, if you pretend that you don't have any time series data, it, it totally almost works. Other questions? Um, I think you had a bullet point in there that referenced something about uh, Spark running on Yarn and some kind of a limitation. I was wondering if you could go into that, or maybe I misread it. Oh, um, there are a bunch of interesting uh, features which happen when I don't actually know where that bullet point is. But yeah, we can talk about it anyways. Uh, and we'll put this slide up, because it's got a picture of Bun Bun. Uh, so yeah, Spark on Yarn has some challenges with Python, um, and this is that a uh, yarn container is um, you have to split your memory, you have to manage your memory essentially intelligently. And Spark doesn't do that uh, when it comes to Python. Uh, we reserve 90% of the memory for the JVM and 10% of the memory for everything else. And so if you're using Python, uh, all of your data has to fit in 10% of your container memory. And that's kind of rough. Uh, and, but the, the nice thing is like there's this magic knob and you can just tune it. Um, 
And most people end up tuning it by experimentation, uh, also known as just binary search until your code starts working. Any other questions? All right, well, let's uh, okay. thank Holden again for a great talk. Thank you. I'm going to go sleep in a bathtub now. Thank <laughs> you.